Chicago. This is Ziff Sistron, and I hope the audio is a little bit better today. I have a special guest for you today, and we have a special book for you today, The Wall of Respect. And guess what? Miss Rebecca is going to tell us how is it that she documented this beautiful art piece here in the city of Chicago long, long, long time ago. But as you know, uh, Rebecca, that lady's looking at you because Rebecca's <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> Rebecca's got to get used to looking at you all out there. That's the way we do this here. But we always take a moment out to start off for people who lost their lives to violence here in the city of Chicago and in the county and in the state. And Ms. Rebecca, if you'll join me, please. Can I call you Miss Rebecca? You can call me Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca. Yeah. If you will pause with us for a moment of silence for people who lost their lives to violence. And we thank you. I want to say hello to everyone today. And I, Miss uh, Rebecca, before we start, I want to gloat a little bit. And I want to show you all a picture, an archive picture, of a gentleman who may be coming home soon. Ha, 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 Blago, guys. The president may be letting him come home, and that would be a blessing. And we thank the president for that gesture. I have a young lady in front of me that has done a very good job in doing and documenting a history of Chicago here uh, on the south side of Chicago. And the program that she documented was called the Wall of Respect. Rebecca, what is the Wall of Respect? So the Wall of Respect was a mural um, that was painted, um, I should say it was created because it was made by painters and photographers in 1967, August of 1967, um, at 43rd and Langley on the south side of Chicago in Bronzeville. Um, it was created by a group of artists um, known as the Organization of Black American Culture. Um, the the um, acronym for that is, o is OBAC, but it's pronounced OBASI. Mm -hmm. um, so they were visual artists, painters and photographers who came together to create a mural of black heroes on wow. the wall of this building at, at, as I said, the corner of 43rd and Langley in the summer of 1967 mm -hmm. um, to, it was really, it was inspired by, in some ways, by Aretha Franklin's song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, the idea of giving respect to black heroes and heroines who were um, excellent in their various um, fields of of knowledge and of activity. So there were um, musicians and sports figures, mm -hmm. politicians, religious figures, um, writers, and people in the theater who were all um, commemorated. I mean, many of them were living, um, who were all represented on the wall. Um, go ahead. Now, the wall started in what year again? 1967. And why did they pick 43rd and Langley? Well, I think they picked it because, um, I mean, in, in some ways it was accidental. It was because of connections that one of the key painters, William Walker, had in that neighborhood. Um, he happened to know Johnny Ray, who was the owner of a TV and radio shop that was in the building. And um, so he, and he had some connections with other people in the neighborhood. Um, so he was able to kind of get the the authorization, not of the owner of the building, but of the people who lived in the neighborhood to paint a mural, to create a mural on the side of the building. Um, I think it was also appealing to many of the artists to do something for the community and to do it in a, in a part of the South Side that was economically depressed mm -hmm. compared to other neighborhoods that, like, they, many of these artists lived in um, in Hyde Park, or they had studios in Hyde Park or nearby, and they weren't they weren't well to do, but they were they had art school training, and they were you know emerging artists who had many of them had teaching positions, or they were you know they were um, becoming successful as artists, mm -hmm. but they wanted to give something back to the to a, a neighborhood, a part of the South Side that mm -hmm. was less advantaged, and so it it made sense. So there was the kind of the 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 connection that William Walker had, plus the appeal of doing something in this particular part of the South Side. 
And how did you get connected to the idea of the Wall of Respect and what drove you to want to do some writing? Well, I was teaching at the University of Chicago for a number of years. I'm, I teach at Northwestern now in the Art History Department, but I was teaching at the University of Chicago, so on the South Side, but my students, many of them came from other parts of the country, other parts of the world. They didn't really have much of a connection to Chicago or to the South Side in particular. And I wanted to kind of help them become more connected and become aware of what was going, around, going on around um, around the South Side, outside the campus, the really rich cultural history that exists on the South mm -hmm. Side. And um, so I started teaching a class, um, a class on art and activism, another class on Chicago in the 1960s, and found, uh, I knew about the Wall of Respect, and I'm not even sure how I became aware of it, but I knew a little bit about it, and I found that there wasn't very much written about it. Um, and there, you know, there were a few things that I could use for teaching purposes, but not as much as this incredible monument really mm -hmm. deserved. And I started wor working with a group of people who were trying to think about ways to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the wall, which just happened last year in 2017. Um, and one of the ways that we imagined doing that was through a symposium, mm -hmm. which was held in 2015, mm -hmm. as a way of kind of jump-starting a conversation about the wall that could continue and create new scholarship and new exhibitions. And it did. I think it, it helped to do that. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that um, was a collaboration between myself and Romy Crawford and Abdul al Kalamat, who we had hoped would be um, the keynote speaker for that symposium. So I was in contact with him about it. But mm -hmm. we, um, he wasn't able to be because of a conflict. But he later did a talk at Northwestern. Um, about the Wall of Respect, and there at the conference was, um, at the conference at Northwestern, was an editor of, from Northwestern University Press mm -hmm. who um, spoke to him then about doing a book, and he got in touch with me and with Romy Crawford, who's a, um, a cultural critic and scholar of photo the history of photography at the School of the Art Institute, um, and, and Abdul, I should say, was one of the founders of Obasi, so he really has a very deep history um, mm -hmm. with the organization and with the wall itself. Was really, although he didn't he didn't paint on the wall or make photographs for it, he was really one of the makers in the sense that he helped to determine the list of people who would be on the wall. And um, he's very active in in politics and art at that time in Chicago. And so, um, so it was a great. It was it was nice to be able to collaborate with them. I learned a lot from them, and um, and you know, putting the book together with all kinds of um, uh, literature, poetry, historical documents, images. Um, you were showing an image a moment ago. I think that um, is an image of a a young boy who I understand was actually a friend of yours at the time. Um, giving tours. So one of the great things that happened um, because of the Wall of Respect was that um, kids who lived in the neighborhood, including our host today, um, uh, were empowered to give tours to visitors. So there were tourists who came who were drawn by the Wall of Respect. So Nina Simone came to the wall to see her portrait yes, on did. it, and yes, Muhammad Ali came to the wall to see his portrait on it, and many other people came just to see it. Um, and the children in the neighborhood were able to um, make a little extra change, spare change, giving tours. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear more from you. I don't know if you want to talk about your experience I, I do, wall. I do. Yeah. Let me tell you what she was, she's talking about. The wall of respect over here, right, right here in this little section here, I used to sit on a milk crate what they call the bungle beaters. I was 11 years old at the Wall of Respect. The Wall of Respect was built by a group of Obasi that was, how many artists? Well, that's a disputed uh, number, but I think 14 is the number of the original artists, and then there were others who contributed after the, after the original making of the wall. So the thing, I, I had to fall into the wall, in love with the wall because that's why I learned how to play baseball, playing wall ball, strike out. <laughs> so when these guys came in my neighborhood and started all these paints and all these people started coming and by the way the police came and the FBI came what did you learn that the Chicago police was monitoring down there the Red Squad or something like that yeah so it was the Red Squad um, and also the FBI COINTELPRO um, the so basically 
they were monitoring any activity that they associated with black extremists or um, black the black power movement. And I'm not sure that they were especially interested in the art. I mean, they, they did maintain files on some of the artists, I think, but, um, but they maintain, maintained files on a lot of organizations that were active around the wall because it became kind of a rallying point. It became a place for um, people to hold political rallies and to make speeches and to try to um, kind of rally community support for different political causes. And the, the police were, um, were, you know, they were, I mean, they were infiltrating and monitoring all different kinds of black organizations wow. in that time period. And so it just kind of inevitably became a, a site where they did surveillance. Now, you actually looked at, at the Chicago Historic Society, some files on that the police had been monitoring down there? Yeah, I mean, and and I have to say, I'm, you know, they, I can't reveal any information. Oh, you can about, reveal it. I can't. No, I mean, no, no, no. I, I, TV, like, I had to, I have to actually sign something <laughs> saying that I would not reveal any, fans aren't any, watching. <laughs> any information about um, because there's a court there's a court agreement that says that you know you you can't you can't reveal information about organizations that were under surveillance without the consent of officers of that organization. So I can't talk about any of the organizations, but I can say definitively, because it's not an organization, they had um, surveillance going on at 43rd and Langley. <laughs> There, you know, the ad, I think I can reveal the address wow. because the address isn't an organization. <laughs> There's no one, to, no one to give permission or not for the address. Wow. So, yeah, so they're definitely, um, they, were, they were doing surveillance at 43rd and Langley. Um, quite a lot of it during, you know, the events of when the wall was being unveiled and there were, you know, various political speakers that were coming through. Now, those of you who want to join us, you can. You can join this conversation by dialing 312-738-1060 and give your opinion. Now, why or how do you grow as a writer? No, let me go back for the people who are writers. How do you plan to write and how, when did you find time to write and how did you get rid of the writer's block? <laughs> um, that's a good question. The um, writer's block first. Yeah, so I, I guess I just always need something I, I don't have too much of a problem writing once I get started. It's always like the sort of the getting started part is, as long as I have something on paper or on the computer to work with. So what I try to do is just to kind of turn off any sort of like self-censoring or any kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, sense that like what I'm writing isn't good enough and just like get something down that I can edit later. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it's just about kind of that first step of like getting things, getting things written. I mean, with this book, it was in some ways, it was um, the material presented itself to us to, to be written about because um, there, you know, the, it's, the book is actually full of, of interviews and documents and photos and um, biographies and things that, that where it wasn't so much about a kind of, I mean, there's some creative aspects to it, but it wasn't so much about creative writing. It was really just kind of trying to contextualize, like give some context for the wall, both, you know, p politically and historically. Um, and it, it, I mean, in some ways it kind of wrote itself. We were under a pretty heavy deadline pressure to get it done for the 50th anniversary. Um, mm -hmm. We really wanted it out in 2017 and we did get it out in 2017. Wonderful. Um, the, yeah, it was, it was, um, you know, it was a great collaboration. And I think it, yeah, this, I mean, I've, this is in some ways, like I said, it kind of, it kind of wrote itself. It was, it was one of the, um, the more enjoyable writing experiences that I've had. What do you advise people who may have an interesting story and might want to write about something. What do you advise people who want to write but don't know how to write? Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think, um, I think like speaking it actually is, um, you know, if you can, if you can um, have someone ask you questions as a, kind of like an interview or record it, especially, I mean, if it's a personal story, I think um, Kind of starting out as a conversation, like like speaking, recording it, transcribing it, and then beginning to edit. Um, I think that could be a you know a really good way to get started, um, because I think that that kind of helps with that first step of like the you know the initial hurdle of getting something on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, the, uh, another question, I, and God, please don't let me forget this here thought because it's a wonderful one. And I, I, it came back to me. Why are you interested? No, 
the people who are watching this show, 50 years ago, duh, really? Why am I interested in something 50 years ago, Ziff, Rebecca? Why are you telling me something 50 years ago? Why would I be interested in something 50 years ago? Well, I think, um, in, you know, in large part because the issues that people were responding to in 1967 are issues that are still with us. And what I mean, are some of those issues? It's about racial oppression. It's about, I mean, it's really, it's, you know, it's kind of the Black Lives Matter of its day because it's about respect. It's about respect for African-American heroes. And it's about putting black faces in a positive light into the public sphere, into, into public space. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, you know, is still lacking in this country. Um, it's something that people still, you know, people are still facing oppression, discrimination, racism, all, you know, like this whole um, kind of miasma of American society that people are still experiencing. And so thinking about ways that artists came together, people came together in a, in a collective, in a collaboration to try to find solutions that are, I mean, they're not solutions of, really of a practical nature, that, which is, you know, and practical solutions are also really important, but it's, it was solutions of a symbolic nature. It was putting images into public space for people to see and, you know, ideally be inspired by and um, be prompted to, you know, kind of like challenged by and to you know to think about what 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 can I do differently in my life how can I be involved in um, you know in making social change happen mm -hmm. so I think that the you know there 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 are things that are still relevant today that have to do with what images appeared on the wall there are also things that are still important today still relevant today that have to do with just the very act of joining together in a collective to do something. And I think that's something that, in some ways, we've lost. Um, I think it was it was um, it was easier in the 1960s and 1970s for people to imagine coming together and working together on a political project. Um, and so that I think th there's something there's something for us to learn. There's something for this story to teach us about um, ways that people make change happen because we're so. Um, you know, um, I think America's been a, a very individualistic society for a long time, but I think now we're even more fragmented because of social, the way social media works, all, you know, the, the, that people are not finding spaces to come together and work together on, on political projects like this. So I think there's, you know, there's, there's something, there's some things about it that, that certainly might seem dated, like the choices that were made about the heroes to go on the wall, we might make different That's choices right. today. That would be interesting. Um, but I think the, 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 the action, the act of doing it is something that's really, um, you know, really retains its relevance. And African Americans were never projected on any images, whether it be television, radio, in such large dynamics and on public way. That yeah. had never been happening in the United States. And this was the first thing, first time this has happened. Right. Explain that to me. Right. Yeah, so one of the things that, so, so Jeff Donaldson, who was one of the key painters of the Wall of Respect, he, he um, was one of the two painters who worked on the jazz section, um, which is, yeah, right um, is yes, section. exactly. Um, he um, he wrote. He was one of the people to write about the wall following um, its its creation and its eventual demolition. And he one of the things that he pointed out is that in the 1960s in um, in Chicago in public space in you know in America um, even billboards that were trying to sell something to African American communities didn't use African American faces on their on the billboard. So even if you had like, you know, a, a cigarette ad on a billboard in on the south side of Chicago, it would be white people depicted on the billboard. And that this was this wasn't trying to sell anything, but it was that it was it was putting um, the images of important African Americans into public space was a was an incredible intervention. It was an incredible novelty um, and it really made a really powerful political statement and that I mean I think that's something that is less visible to us now like what a powerful political statement it was at the time because we've become more accustomed to seeing black faces in the public sphere mm -hmm. but um, but at the time it was really it was it was really an important intervention in that way let me let me step back for a minute because I can't believe that I'm actually sitting here hearing someone say 
that the images that you saw on the wall of respect, the wall of truth, which was the wall built in behind it the next year or so, mm -hmm. that African American images in this country had never ever been on any type of billboards. They didn't have. Well, they probably or did they have billboards with African Americans? On? I, you know. The, so the, Good so research I'm, for somebody I'm, out there. Yeah, it is research for somebody out there because I can't I can't say categorically that there weren't any, but I think there were not very many, and that's you know Jeff what Jeff Donaldson was saying was that he I mean he certainly didn't see any, so he was making you know he was making the claim that there weren't any, um, and I think it's highly likely that there weren't any because you know there, the. The, the the visual American visual culture was so white up until fairly recently. There weren't, you know, like the the baby dolls, right? That the children played with, that that young girls and and maybe boys also played with, um, were if you know they were they were white dolls for black children, mm -hmm. and that you know that. Um, that continued up until you know. I, th I think it's still an, it's still an issue, right? Wow. Um, but it's something that we don't even think about. I mean, in, certainly in, in Ebony magazine, there were cigarette ads featuring African Americans, but out in public on the street, I'm not I'm not so sure there were. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you're looking at uh, Green Slate Institute for Justice again. My name is Ziff Sistrunk, and I'm sitting here with Rebecca. Say your last name for me. Zorak. Zorak, like my friend James Gira. Uh, we got a couple of more minutes left. Uh, I really appreciate the effort. I have a very important question. Now, the wall of respect, the pictures that was on it back then, if you tell me a couple of people that if you had to do it over again, who would you put on the wall of respect now? Well, so I, one of the things that, um, one of the big decisions that was made by the group was not to include a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because he was, he was still, this is 1967, so King had not died. But right. you didn't, and these people, Mo, Mi, Nina Simone was alive, she mm -hmm. came to the wall. Gwendolyn yeah. Brooks was alive, she came yeah. to the wall. I met Muhammad Ali, I met Vice President uh, Hubert Humphrey. And guess what? You will never forget this as we get ready to wrap up. I'm going to give her one little word and we're going to wrap up because we got about two minutes left. The first time I appeared on television mm -hmm. was at the Wall of Respect 51 years ago. Your host appeared on television, and here's something that you probably will not uh, believe. I have been on television, rather be like I was today in a, a press conference with Rod Bregorovich. I have been on television either in a news clipping, a press conference, playing baseball, wiping up blood from kids getting killed in the streets, would you believe for 50 years, ever since that moment, I have been on television at the story or news or something for 50 years, believe it or not. And it all derived right here from the wall of respect. Give me some closing words on what the experience was like writing about the wall of respect. Well, I guess I would, you know, I think the thing that I would like to imagine was that the kind of... Um, positive collective experience of working on the book was in some way kind of uh, a reflection of the collective experience of making the wall to begin with. Um, I think it was it was um, it was just it was great working with Abdul and Romy and pulling together all these different materials to sort of try to represent the wall respect try to like see it from all different angles and reconstruct so many things about it. Um, and um, yeah, I think that it, you know the, it was just like a it was a multi-faceted experience working on the the book. Just as the Wall of Respect itself was, you know, had had all of these different kinds of um, heroes represented, and then but then also generated all of these different kinds of activities around it. All the, the you know, poetry that was read, and the concerts that were performed, and the speeches that were delivered. Um, just so I, you know, I think that in some way we're trying to represent that multifarious activity around the wall in the book that we produced. Wow, and the product that we must produce today is to say thank you to Miss Rebecca. You're very welcome. Zorak. 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 Uh, we thank you. Um, we want to thank you for joining us again tonight. Again, The Wall of Respect was the book that Rebecca wrote. And two other authors. What were their names? Abdul Al Kalamat and Romy Crawford. And, and the full title is "The Wall of Respect: Public Art and Black Liberation in 1960s Chicago." And if a if a task wants to be gone, never leave it till it's done. Bit the labor, big or small, do it well or not at all. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank God for the Wall of Respect. We'll see you next week. Thank you.
and go in peace. Bye-bye.